Welcome to the Graduate Center. Um, my name is Chase Robinson, and I have the, uh, uh, as president, I have the great privilege of, um, of getting the evening off to a start. A word or two about the Graduate Center for those of you who are new to 365 Fifth Avenue, or who know it as B. Altman. The Graduate Center, as the name would imply, is uh, devoted uh, entirely to graduate education. Indeed, we're a national leader in doctoral education and increasingly master's education as well. Some of you will know we're home to pioneering research in the arts and sciences. We're home to winners of the Nobel Prize, the Guggenha Guggenheim, Pulitzer, uh, uh, a large number of such accolades. We're one of the largest PhD granting institutions in the country. And I'm very proud to say that we rank among the country's top 10 institutions in awarding doctorates to students from underrepresented minority groups. <laughs> Indeed, no other graduate school, and I say this, I must say I'm not an objective observer, but I, but I, um, I feel no shame in saying that no other graduate school, indeed graduate institution in the country, takes more seriously its public responsibilities or realizes more fully its mission, which in our case is to advance knowledge as a public, a public good. The Graduate Center is not just a place, however, dedicated to advanced education and research. It's also a proven ground of ideas which delivers the very best research and scholarship to and indeed far beyond the city of New York. Each year, our doctoral students as part of their training teach no fewer than 200,000 CUNY undergraduates. Finally, the Graduate Center, and this is especially appropriate given tonight's event, the Graduate Center is an incubator of vigorous debate reflected not only in our academic programs, not only in our scores of free public events, but also in our 30 institutes and centers. The Leon Levy Center for Biography is one of those centers. And tonight, you have the pleasure of celebrating with me and our colleagues the 10th anniversary of this hub for emerging and preeminent writers and scholars, and indeed for readers of biography. Created in 2007 through the generosity of the Leon Levy Foundation, the Leon Levy Center is a perfect complement to the Graduate Center's ambitions and strengths. The Leon Levy Center seeks to foster the writing of biography and to promote the public understanding of biography, and as such, it epitomizes our commitment to fostering outstanding scholarship and creative work. Tonight's annual lecture is part of a tradition that has brought important, indeed, world-renowned biographers to the Graduate Center. The likes of Bob Caro, David Levering Lewis, Sir Richard Holmes, Dame Hermione Lee, and indeed, tonight's speaker, Taylor Branch. I should also say that in addition to hosting this lecture, the Leon Levy Center sponsors a range of public programs, conferences, indeed clinics for practitioners and enthusiasts. Most important of all, it offers resident fellowships to outstanding and emerging biographers and to doctoral students working on biography as a genre. Through these fellowships, writers are afforded the resources, the time, and the space they need to dedicate themselves to their craft. I should say, finally, in closing, that this model is indeed a powerful and a successful model. No fewer than 14 Leon Levy fellows have published biographies over the last few years, one of which was awarded the National Book Circle, Critics Circle Award just earlier this year. So, do enjoy the evening, and now please join me in welcoming our own Pulitzer Prize winning biographer, Kai Bird, who is the executive director of the Leon Levy Center, 
who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Chase, for that very generous introduction. Uh, I'm brand new here, just six months on the job. So this is my very first Leon Levy lecture. Um, I want to thank not only Chase, but uh, Provost Joy Connolly, David Nassau, and everyone else here at CUNY who have been most welcoming. And also my predecessor, I think, is here tonight too, Gary Giddens. Uh, <laughs> Gary ran the, the Biography Center for five years. And his news, I know, is that he has, since leaving, has finished the second volume of his wonderful biography of Bing Crosby, which will be coming out next year. I also want to acknowledge the presence of two other previous directors, at least Nancy Milford and Brenda Wineapple, who helped to lay the foundations for the center. And, not, not, and last but not least uh, is Thad Zilkowski, who is our new associate director, who's been working very hard to put this together. I'm very especially grateful to Shelby White and her team, including Judith Dobrinsky, for giving me this terrific opportunity to cultivate the art of biography. This is a very special occasion. Um, this lecture was actually founded in the memory of Shelby White's late husband, Leon Levy, who was himself not a biographer, but from all accounts, a prescient financier and intellectual of wide interests and a most generous philanthropist. He was also the author, I've suddenly realized, of a memoir, The Mind of Wall Street, which I think remains relevant to anyone interested in, quote, the perils of greed and the mysteries of the market. Uh, anyway, Shelby has supported the Leon Levy Center for, ten, for a decade now, and we are all the beneficiaries. Um, uh, Chase said there are 14. Actually, by my count, I think there are now 16 published biographies. Um, and I'll mention just a few, Adam Begley on Updike, Ruth Franklin on Shirley Jackson, Langdon Hammer on James Merrill, John Madison, The Lives of Margaret Fuller, D.T. Max uh, for a, a biography of da uh, David Foster Wallace. And many more are forthcoming, including Michael Massing's long-awaited biography of Luther and Erasmus, will be published next March, and Andrew Meyer's much-anticipated biography of the Morgenthau family. And I also hear rumors that one of last year's fellows, Heather Clark, who may also be here, has nearly finished her massive weighty volume on the life of Sylvia Plath, to be published by Knopf. Um, so I also want to take the, a moment to just recognize the uh, fellows that have just been announced who are going to be with us for the next year. And uh, wave your hand or stand up as, as, when I mention your name. Justin Gifford on Eldridge Cleaver. Eleanor Randolph on Michael Bloomberg. Bruce Weber on E.L. Doctorow. Lindsay Whalen on Mary Oliver. And finally, Mickey Kaufman on Henry Kissinger. This is quite a lineup of terrific writers with subjects. And I look forward to working with them all over the course of the next year. But tonight we are here to honor Taylor Branch. Taylor is best known for his trilogy of the civil rights movement, America in the King Years. The first volume, Parting the Waters, won the Pulitzer Prize in 1989. Two successive volumes won similar acclaim and still remain essential texts to any understanding of the role that Martin Luther King played in transforming our nation. Along the way, Taylor won uh, a, 
in addition to the Pulitzer Prize, a five-year MacArthur Fellowship, the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, the National Humanities Medal, and many other prizes. But I think he would agree that this extraordinary career really began in 1970, when he took a very low-paid job with Charlie Peters, <laughs> the legendary founder and editor of the Washington Monthly, a very small circulation political opinion and reporting magazine, which still exists. I strongly suspect that Taylor learned his trade as a journalist and book author while working for Peters for three years. A few years later, I went through a similar process myself, but working for Victor Navasky at The Nation magazine here in New York. Both of us arguably became biographers after immersing ourselves in journalism. Oddly enough, Taylor and I also both worked in the 1972 campaign for George McGovern. He didn't know this, but I was just a lowly canvasser knocking on doors in California, Nebraska, and Minnesota. Taylor, however, had a slightly more elevated campaign position in Austin, Texas, where he happened to share an apartment with one Bill Clinton. That friendship survived the McGovern electoral debacle, and Taylor later was routinely sneaking into the Clinton White House to record Bill's thoughts about the presidency. This resulted in Taylor's 2009 book, The Clinton Tapes, Wrestling with History. All of this is to say that Taylor Branch has led an incredibly colorful life as a journalist, historian, and biographer. And now he's going to share with us a few words about the perils of biographical history. Taylor Branch. Thank you, Kai. Thank you to the Leon Levy Center, to Ms. White, for all of you who are here and the, and the previous fellows, it's, it's an honor to be the 10th. I don't need to be a dame or a sir. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just happy to be here with uh, previous uh, speakers for this occasion. Uh, like Bob Carroll, we once spent an evening wondering whether we could survive multi-decade, multi-volume enterprises, and I'm blessed to see that we both have so far. Um, so it is, um, it, it's an honor to be here and to discuss biography, and I want to say right from the beginning that my topic is perils of biographical history, but I don't want any of you who are doing biographies to believe that you can't just go blithely right along without any perils writing biographies. My perils have to do specifically with biographical history in the area of race, where I believe that we grossly underestimate uh, the, the subject at hand. And I'm gonna try to explain why and why that is both a burden and a, and a huge opportunity for, for citizens and scholars uh, in, in this era. Um, I think biography meets history at the beginning in basics like vocabulary and point of view, which are crucial uh, in that. And of course, I'm always asked, you know, how can you write a book about a black man when you're a white southerner? But I'm also asked, I thought you were black. So um, it, it, it just goes to show the, um, the quicksand in the terrain here when, when you approach that. I began to learn lessons about, about the special properties of trying to understand race through people long before I ever dreamed of becoming a writer. In 1969, less than a year after Dr. King was killed, I was a graduate student at Princeton and I was haunted by the fact that the civil rights movement had changed the direction of my life's interests against my will Growing up in Atlanta, it was relentless all through my childhood. I was in the first grade of the year of the Brown decision. I graduated from college, 
in the year Dr. King was killed, and all through those formative years, uh, the movement was pounding away, and it scared everybody to death. And uh, it was only later that I learned most people are lying who say that they were in the middle of the movement and were Dr. King's best friend. Um, it, it, was, it was a scary event. But I, I was upset that I had missed it. Uh, other than picketing the White House once when I was with Al Lowenstein, uh, but if you were with Al Lowenstein, you were going to pick at the White House. I couldn't, I couldn't take too much credit for that. I had missed it, and I really wanted to have some experience with it. And so in the summer of 69, between my two years at the Woodrow Wilson School, I defied the program, which was that you were supposed to work for the Ford Foundation or some policy-relevant institution, and I got a job from John Lewis and Vernon Jordan at the Voter Education Project in Atlanta. They told me they had 20 counties in far south southeastern Georgia that were so small they didn't even have any names on their Rolodex about people who might be willing and able to run a voter regis regis registration project in counties with black majorities and virtually no registered, black registered voters. This was a shock to me, first of all, because it was four years after the Voting Rights Act, and I thought since I'd seen black people voting for the first time on TV that it was a universal experience. So it was a shock to go down there and find that it was not only like it was before 1965, but like it was before maybe 1865 in some of these uh, counties where I saw black prisoners come out of the jail on the courthouse lawn on Saturday morning with shoes of the local upstanding citizens that they had shined for them to go to church on their way to mow their lawns. Um, this was really like a time capsule to go there, and I was profoundly unprepared to be alone, and I had three days to go into sight unseen into these counties and see if I could find somebody um, that Vernon and John Lewis could talk to. Um, Columbus was not more lost when he set sail for the West than I was when I went into these tiny little counties looking for the next Martin Luther King and all the preachers threw me out instantly. Um, so did the school principals uh, and especially the funeral parlor directors um, who gave me lectures about how they had things very well under control. Then I went out into the juke joints thinking that I could recruit kind of the rebels, the Stokely Carmichaels, the black power types who didn't exist uh, in places like Bubba Doo's Big Apple. Um, where I was arrested for being on the wrong side of town. Um, so I was lost and it took me about a month before I started talking to women, which I never would have done at the beginning. You, you go in with your, uh, your preconceptions of the time. And that was difficult too, until one day I was recommended that this old, they called her an 1800s person, matriarch in Schley County, this tiny county in Georgia, if anybody knew anybody that was brave enough to be interested in this voting stuff, it would be she. And I got these directions, you know, old country style, you go down this road until it dead ends and then go until you see two big dead trees on the right and turn at the next left. And anyway, there she was on her porch rocking and I started talking to her about voting in, in Schley County and how important it was and she rocked and she didn't say anything. She didn't acknowledge my name. I had talked for a long time and I, I was beginning to panic that it was the wrong person. And finally she said, young man, do you really believe we landed on the moon last night? Because this was July 23rd, the day after Neil Armstrong landed on the moon. And I said, Yes, ma'am, I do. I saw it on Walter Cronkite at the motel last night. Yes, we landed on the moon. And she looked at me, and she didn't say a word. She just kept rocking. And I'm trying to figure out what that has to do with voter registration or whether she was just a fan of the space program or something. So we're, we're talking, and so, but I knew that she knew at least something about current events. Uh, and she had a wise, craggy face. And... I kept talking and she didn't say anything. And you, you're around a lot of graduate students. When graduate students get nervous, they tend to use bigger words. So I'm trying to explain. 
I'm trying to explain to her what a 501c3 organization like VEP is and how the grants are necessary and some of the statistics about voting. And she didn't say anything. And um, it went on for at least five or 10 minutes. And finally, the next question out of her mouth was, she said, have you ever seen the Simon Eyes Wax commercial? And I, and I was really flummoxed, but I thought about it and I said, you mean the one where the little children float across the kitchen floor on an invisible shield of Simon Eyes Wax and they don't scuff the floor? Cause um, and, and she didn't say anything, but I said, I, I think I know what she's getting at. Yes, I saw that, but that's a commercial. They can make it look like the kids are floating on an invisible shield, but I saw the moon landing on a news show. So now I'm trying to explain the difference between a commercial and a news show about what's real and what's not real. Anyway, this conversation went on for about an hour, but she only chipped in every now and then, you know, with questions like, have you ever been in a fist fight? Um, but, and that she could prove that we didn't land on the moon because if we had, all we had to do was fill up our tank on the moon and on the next leap we could make it into heaven and you know God wouldn't let us do that. So we didn't land on the moon and by then I already knew that meant she was not interested in voter registration in this county because it went to the marrow of life and death, people trying to vote. Um, but the way she made this point was so indelible to me and so dumbfounding to me that I went back to the motel and scribbled down every bit of dialogue, everything I said, everything she said. Um, and it was the beginning of a summer diary that reached 400 pages by the end of the summer. The first thing I ever wrote that was not assigned, it was not meant for publication. I turned it into Princeton and got in big trouble <laughs> in the graduate program because I was supposed to write a memo. Um, but one of the professors sent it to Charlie Peters at the Washington Monthly who published excerpts of it almost without asking me. Uh, that was how Charlie was, but that's how, what led me into journalism. Um, the point of this though was that I had been reading everything I could about the civil rights movement to try to find out what had happened, that it had so much power on Southerners and so much power on the nation uh, in my early youth. And most of it was analytical and full of labels about who was militant, who was radical, what was economic, what was, what was religious, um, and, and political labels, and none of it felt like the movement that I saw. But the personal discovery that I had from people in South Georgia like this Simon Eyes Wax woman um, w made me realize that discovery in race is when things get very personal and you forget all these labels and they scramble and you can put them back together later. And um, I, I resolved that if I ever could write about the civil rights movement, I would try to write in a narrative style about the people involved rather than the analytical concepts which I think float over the realities of race like paper airplanes. Um, that's why my books on race are long and fat because they're stories. And it raises the tension about the, the reality of stories that are personal versus the historical impact that comes from the concepts that we really deal with. And that is, to me, the perils of historical biography uh, grounded in race. I started, <clears throat> I, it was only the beginning of my troubles with p point of view though. I, uh, after a few years at the Washington Monthly, I started trying, I realized I'm never gonna grow up. Uh, I thought I was just in journalism till I could decide whether to be a professor or a political activist. Um, and that journalism was a good place to, to uh, bide my time and be an observer. But I thought I would become a writer and the way to write, break into book writing in those days was as a ghost writer. So my first ghost written book was with John Dean about what, uh, Watergate. I lived in his house um, in the basement with Mo. And 
and uh, Road Blind Ambition, which has ruined my, my Wikipedia page because conspiracists constantly say that I helped perpetrate the conspiracy of John Dean blaming Watergate on Nixon and the Republicans when in fact he was the mastermind uh, and he was the evil person and I was his amanuensis. Um, but it gave me experience in writing from the point of view of someone else. I was John Dean in this book. And the next one I did was with Bill Russell. I thought I would write with somebody as different as possible from John Dean in practice. And, and so I went and lived with Bill Russell in Seattle uh, and learned, it was an amazing year, and I learned from him that he's not only got the world's greatest laugh and the Cracker Barrel philosopher, but he thinks deeply about sport. He said, all sport, each sport is its own mix of art and war. And anybody who's gonna be good in the sport understands that. There are many uneducated top tier athletes, but there are no dumb top tier athletes who understand the nature of their sport. Um, so I thought having finished the Russell book, which he insisted be co-authored by him and me <laughs> in his voice, so that the, the point of view really didn't make a lot of sense, um, but I wrote it in his voice. Then I thought, this is what novelists do. They create lots of characters, and, and, the, and the writer writes in a lot of these um, different points of view, so I'm ready to write a novel. So poor Alice Mayhew, who had done the, the Dean book, uh, signed me up for a novel uh, that got very good reviews and sold about 500 copies. Um, and I said to Alice, how many more books do I have to do until I can do the civil rights movement? I want to write a narrative history of the civil rights movement. And she said, well, um, race books don't sell. Uh, you probably need to write another one. So I wrote some other books, but finally came back. And I didn't enjoy reading in novels anyway, uh, which is what novelists do. Uh, and it's why I don't really enjoy reading. I'm gonna read you something. I'm gonna read you the preface to Parting the Waters because I think it stands up after six years immersed in the research for Parting the Waters. The first question I wanted to address is the question we're here to talk about tonight. The tension between biography and history where race is involved because I think that it goes to the tension that I want to discuss about how our history is so screwed up now because of race. But I didn't know that this time. This is, this is written in 1988, 20 years after Martin Luther King, uh, and 19 years after I met the Simon Eyes Wax Lady. It's only two paragraphs. Almost as color defines vision itself, rape, race shapes the cultural eye what we do and do not notice, the reach of empathy and the alignment of response. This subliminal force recommends care in choosing a point of view for a history grounded in race. Strictly speaking, this book is not a biography of Martin Luther King Jr., though he is at its heart. To recreate the perceptions within his inherited world would isolate most readers, including myself, far outside familiar boundaries. But to focus upon the historical king as generally established by his impact on white society would exclude much of the texture of his life, which I believe makes for unstable history and collapsible myth. To overcome these pitfalls of race, I have tried to make biography and history reinforce each other by knitting together a number of personal stories along the main seam of an American epic. Like King himself, this book attempts to rise from an isolated culture into a larger history by speaking more than one language. So that's how I undertook to spend 24 years uh, writing the movement in, in three volumes, the King years. I think King was the best metaphor for a movement that set in motion changes in America grounded in race that spread far beyond race. 
And the question was, how well do we understand the blessings that that engendered and the lessons that that leads for us now? And the answer is not very well, not very well so far. And I think a lot of this is because of this tension between race being personal and our history being the concepts, the vocabulary, the lessons, the frame of work, the point of, point of view that we have for all of history. And so I told stories in the, in the, in the book, and I'm gonna give you three examples that I think resonate with larger lessons but that the lessons are lost. One was I told the story of the New York Times v. Sullivan case. It is still the prevailing law taught in law school about libel, Supreme Court decision. It grew out of the sit-ins. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the sit-ins and King and what the sit-ins meant to King. But in the sit-ins in 1960, they had sit-ins around the, the Alabama Capitol in Montgomery um, and at that same time, um, King had been indicted for income tax evasion on a trumped up charge. And the governor, and they had these sit-ins around the Capitol and Harry Belafonte, still here, and Bayard Rustin, the late Bayard Rustin, wrote an ad for the New York Times to raise money for King's defense in his tax trial. And it was a full page ad in the Times. And it said, here there are rising voices and there was a picture of the arrests in Montgomery, and it said that um, constitution-breaking um, enforcement officers arrested students for protesting the segregation laws. For this ad, the governor, the police chief, assorted officials in Alabama filed a libel suit against the signatories on the bottom of the ad, many of whom didn't even know what was in the ad, um, and against the New York Times, took it to court where under Alabama law they, were, they proved there were two factual errors. The text said that they surrounded the Alabama Capitol when in fact they only were on two sides and not the other two sides. And it said that they sang um, My Country Tis of Thee when in fact they sang America the Beautiful. These two facts allowed under Alabama law, the jury to decide whether the factual errors were libelous and they heaped upon the signatories, Ralph Abernathy and uh, the people there and the New York Times, $3 million in libel judgments, 50 times larger than they had ever done before. So this is the governor, the mayor, uh, all of these people trying to break the movement. Law students today read New York Times v. Sullivan and have absolutely no idea that it has anything to do with race. Because the case and the reasoning is, is all about malice and evidence of malice before and so on and so forth. It is so denatured that you have no idea of the chief reality here, which was the nature of American race relations in this time was that the Supreme Court could not afford to say the lower courts and juries in a whole region of our country are, are run wild with racial malice. And this is a ridiculous case, it never should have come. You can't say that. They had to invent a new standard of constitutional law for students to still study in order to rescue, rescue this case by stealth. Another case, I spent four chapters on this, Birmingham, 1963. King, when the sit-in started, King said, our movement is based on the deep wells of democracy. This is not about race, this is about justice, this is about redeeming the soul of American democracy. And he, he laid out all the principles and he preached himself to death in the 1950s and was very frustrated, but when the sit-ins came, he said he was the first and only adult black leader, even though he was just a few years older than these kids, he was in his 20s, who said, this is a breakthrough because certain aspects of human nature are so stubborn that words and principles are not enough. You must amplify it by sacrifice. These kids, you can't boycott a place that won't let you in. These kids have figured out a way to 
accent their discipline and their faith in the American dream with sacrifice. And he said there are two basic principles that they understood that America is about self-governing public trust and citizens willing to put themselves on the line for it. Three years later, in 1963, the movement had gone through the sit-ins, the freedom rides, um, Ole Miss, great crises. King was terrified that no landmarks were going to be laid. The movement was going to recede. And he went into Birmingham as a great gamble, trained people for months, didn't tell his father he was going to go because he knew his father would uh, object. Um, went in there, mounted this struggle, and it was, uh, it, it was a tremendous failure. People were too scared to go to Bull Connor's jail, and they ran out of adults who were willing to go through the training. He was on the verge of leaving Birmingham in retreat when young aides came to him and said, we, have a, we don't have any adults willing to go to jail, but, but children will. And in May, on May 2nd, 1963, he took the biggest gamble of his life, and on May 1st, they had 12 adults ready to go to jail. On May 2nd, they had 600 kids who marched out of the, out of the 16th Street Church. And on May 3rd, they had 1,000, as young as six years old, mostly girls. This is when the dogs and the fire hoses were loosed on them. Um, these are the images that went around the world and, in my view, melted the emotional distance that the rest of the country had on civil rights, under which people were saying, this is terrible, a new leader should do something about this, President Kennedy should do something about this. But when people saw these photographs of the dogs and fire hoses loosed on small children, they said, we need to do something about this. And it, and it had an explosive effect in black communities such that there were 700 demonstrations in 100 cities within the next six weeks. This was what King said, we are on a breakthrough. This is why he said we're gonna have the March on Washington. This is why Jack Kennedy introduced the Civil Rights Bill, because he said, we have to stop this. This is, this is, a, this is a wildfire growing out of Birmingham. I argue in the books, historically, that the Birmingham Children's Marches are almost, almost biblical, like the Passover, uh, in ascribing changes in a great nation to the witness of school children. To me, the salient fact is that you can read PhD dissertations today on a minor modification in an attack ad that might affect a Senate race. But I know of no PhD dissertations on the Birmingham Children's Marches. Pundits didn't know anything about it. They didn't know how it came about. They didn't know anything about the titanic struggles and protests of the black parents who accused Martin Luther King of being criminal to subject their children uh, to criminal records uh, in a losing movement, and yet they were converted by the witness of their own children so that these same parents supported them. To me, this is, this is a turning point in all of American history that is unanalyzed, that is unrecorded, unstudied by the American Academy, by American journalists, by American pundits, because it's too embarrassing and it's too far outside of our accepted reality, which is precisely why it needs to be studied. Another story in that same year, 1963, King gave a speech in which he said, George Wallace is delivering minor little classics speeches that I think will be significant in American future. This is the same George Wallace who had started 1963 saying segregation forever was the preeminent symbol of, of racial bigotry in the United States. At the end of 1963, after the March on Washington, the Kennedy assassination, George Wallace modified his stump speech because he was gonna run for president. He expunged all references from race. He claimed baldly that he had never made a statement that reflected poorly on anyone because of race that his campaign was, had nothing to do with race, that he wanted to restore local government against pointy-headed bureaucrats, biased media, tyrannical judges, and centralized government. And that was, he basically invented the, the vocabulary of modern politics. And King recognized it, said these are little classics. 
at that same time, he recognized that NBC did a, did a three-hour special on race in which, with no, with no commercials, three-hour primetime special race, and they interviewed Ross Barnett, the governor of Mississippi, who said, this is obvious what's going on here. This is a conspiracy by liberals and the na national media to concentrate all effective power in the central government based on overemphasizing the race issue in American politics. Now, I told all of these stories, and to me, this is the beginning of modern politics and how we have this unbelievable mismatched march in the last 50 years, two marches. One, the blessings of the children's march have produced not only an end to legal segregation, but changes for women, for immigrants who've been welcomed through the whole world from the Immigrants Act, uh, things that went all around the world, the fall, the freedom movement, uh, as King said, was causing the widest liberation in human history, caused the Soviet Union to fall with a playing we shall overcome. Um, all these changes beyond the imagination of people, marriage equality, people couldn't, I was still in college in, 19, in 1965 and there were no women at the University of North Carolina by state law, except nursing students. These changes were set in motion by equal citizenship, I think, in the, in, in the, the emotional swath of the freedom movement dealing with equal citizenship in ways that applied to women, senior citizens, the disabled, and ultimately, yes, gay rights. So these empirical blessings have flowed even as our political discourse has followed George Wallace and Ross Barnett in the predominant idea that government is bad, which is transparently a way of adjusting politically to the race issue. And Trump is the epitome of it. He, at the end of a 50-year cycle, he has to be explicit about the racial, racial base of it. And at the same time, the emptiness of the anti-government rhetoric, where you don't have to think of a constructive program, all you gotta do is say is Washington is bad, I wanna preserve choices for people and get rid of centralized government. The emptiness is now manifest, but no one really claims the lessons of 50 years from the movement that, that drew upon the heart of patriotism. So I'm just going to sketch, what do we do about this? I want, I want to sketch a few things from the work I'm trying to do now, which is to look at all of American history from the point of view of race and how it affects our history and our politics and, and our memory. I think that that we are paying a price for not understanding how deeply the civil rights movement drew, drew upon the best lessons of, of our political history um, in, in a way that goes to the, to the profundity of the democratic challenge and what the democratic experiment is about. The civil rights movement had a tremendous memory. The failures are in four four different areas, I, I, I'm trying to argue. One is memory, one is constitutional, two is constitutional principle, three is optimism or outlook, and four is the centrality of violence. On memory, Dr. King said, we are drawing on the memory right back to the revolution in which what we need to learn because we don't have any traditional, we don't have armies, we don't have money, we don't have businesses, we don't have police forces. We're largely invisible. What do we have? We have an appreciation for the, for the example and the professed values of American democracy. And they have not been remembered. And King's speeches, you can go through them. We didn't remember them in, in the Civil War. Lincoln says the Civil War is a great, in the second inaugural, that this is a great lesson about offenses for the ages. Um, and in the next 50 years, we forgot that and turned the Civil War into a contest of regional valor. Uh, and, and the academy in the North named 
the process by which terrorism restored white rule in the South and forgot all three of the Civil War amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, as we are now learning. They call that process redemption. It's the official name. Even the revisionist historians who are doing yeoman's work go by the title redemption for the terrorism that eliminated black voters in the South because that's the official name. There's no other way to do it. That's the only vocabulary, just like scalawag and carpetbagger are the only words that came in to the language uh, out of that period. There is no word that came into the language for somebody who wanted the freedmen to vote. So our whole political history that informed our politics grows out of a forgetfulness where race conflicts with American values. So that just as in the 1860s, there were great lessons courageously recognized by Lincoln and then systematically forgotten and turned upside down in the next 50 years until by 1915, the whole country comes together, white people, in The Birth of a Nation and the film, and Woodrow Wilson segregates Washington and, and shows that film in the White House. It also showed in the Supreme Court, by the way, um, because the Chief Justice said he had been a Klansman. North and South came together in an upside down parody of the lessons of the Civil War, dismissing Lincoln. King had a better memory and he said, we have to go beneath this forgetfulness to come up with the accurate history of America because race is the gate to freedom. That's my title, I'm freedom's gate. It's what blocks our perception and our achievement of freedom, but it is also the hope in rare cases when we deal with race, we, real, we push freedom forward. The Constitution, King went right down, back to the revolution and said, there are a lot of structural things about why Americans felt that they could reconstitute a republic after 2,000 years of failure in a world of universal monarchy and dictators and sultans. He said, psychologically, what Madison came up with was that the political experiment rest, rested on the capacity of mankind for self-government and the capacity of mankind to build public trust. All our political experiments rest on the capacity of mankind for self-government. No form of government can secure liberty unless we build virtue in the people, public trust. King said, th this is a profound intellectual challenge, but the founders also said citizens have to that's why he recognized that the sit-in students, beyond the abstract qualities of, the, uh, uh, of, of this, that citizen involvement and taking personal risks in that discipline, like the Freedom Riders did, said nothing is more patriotic than a Freedom Rider who looks in the face of a Klansman who's about to hit him and saying, you may hit me and you may never treat me as a voter, but I believe that our children will come into a political relationship of equal citizenship because of what you and I are doing here. That is, that's about as patriotic and disciplined as you can be. I mean, the ultimate example is Mickey Schwerner, uh, honored here. When he was shot in the summer of 1964, his last words were, sir, I know just how you feel looking at the Klansman with a pistol at his chest who killed him trying to make some contact with this bloodthirsty Klansman at the last moment. Now, it didn't change him and it didn't change his life, but it sure haunted the Klansman, and it convinced the FBI agents that they had believable confessions when they got those same seven words from two different Klansmen. This kind of discipline belief that we can create some sort of boundary uh, relationship across the racial boundaries that, that divide us. The third element that the movement had is optimism, so sorely lacking now when we, sarcasm, political correctness, passes for, passes for wisdom in a cynical society. Uh, King said, we will win our freedom. I may not get there with you, but we will win our freedom because the goal of America is freedom. Um, and he drew that right out of the, uh, of the Constitution that begins with we the people and would talk about how the Constitution is a miraculously optimistic document. Uh, I think all politicians should have to recite the preamble before every debate 
we the people of the United States, in order to establish justice, <laughs> ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the common welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Unbelievably audacious, but also optimistic, and totally at odds with a cynical, government is bad, uh, I'm here to strangle Washington, flight that was engendered by race. But essentially, that there are elements in this country that if they have to be if the choice is between democracy and, and giving up racial division, they'll give up democracy to keep racial division. That's, the, that's how stark the choice is. And lastly, violence. Dr. King said that Madison was trying to make a government that was based on loyalty and armies and the king's discipline, a government that run on votes instead. And what's a vote? A vote is a piece of nonviolence. That's why Madison was such a wimp in the War of 1812. That's what the, the uh, embargoes were about. We want the government to, to run on votes. They had to have the war to prove themselves um, respectable in a world of violence that thought that democracy was fleeting and about to, to go. But it was about establishing the vote. So Dr. King would always say, you think nonviolence is oddball stuff about diets and Indians who won't step on insects. And, and you think that it's crazy. But if you believe in democracy, you believe in votes, you believe in nonviolence, you should be studying the relative impact of violence and nonviolence in modern society. Most of you have never even seen any violence because you live in a society where the, where votes govern your little league teams, your churches, your universities, your everything, plus your politics. And you believe in those votes, and that's the strength of America. That's the only thing I have in common with racists. That, that so far, at least, we've been building something uh, that's about votes instead of violence. So we should be studying violence and nonviolence. I took a course from Hannah Arendt when I was at Princeton who told us that all of po political science had taught that violence and, po and power were synonymous, that they were an extension of one and the other. She said, in the modern world that's in interdependent and built on cooperation, you could build just as good a case that power and violence are opposites, that in a world in which everybody is at war with everyone else, no one has any power. That intellectual challenge, as far as I know, has never been taken up since, but it was deep in Martin Luther King's belief that nonviolence is at the heart of American democracy because votes is, is what the hope of the American uh, experiment is based on. Votes are the greatest invention of nonviolence, and yet we have a thousand words in our vocabulary of violence and only nonviolence for violence and votes. I argue basically that universities and citizens should be studying the civil rights movement as a model of constitutional future, not the quaint past of segregated bus stops, of tremendous power that is spread to, to benefit ecumenical movements all over the world uh, because it's drawing on the, the constitutional power and the promise, almost the nuclear energy inside the model uh, that was formulated in the American Revolution. So that King and James Madison should be studied side by side for lessons. We don't go back to the fundamentals of democracy any longer, and we don't recognize, in my view, that the Civil Rights Movement is right there as modern founders uh, along, alongside them. So our vocabulary is stunted. Currently, most of the scholarship I see, the only choices on race relations are that you are racist or you are anti-racist. It's a binomial theorem that is grossly impoverished. The best people I know say we, dismantle races, we should dismantle racism, but what does that build? In a weird way, I'd even like to look forward and imagine in a world a couple of hundred years from now in which racist is not the word racist draws its meaning entirely from our negative view of race. 
the view that race is all about war and hierarchy. And that has been inherited, and, and that is a reality. I'm not denying that. But in Galileo's day, the same was true of science. And the word scientist now draws its meaning and its valence from the way we feel about science. If the world of race were studied for its roots and its strength, for the good side of democratic potential and not just the bad side, one day we might understand that a racist is somebody who sees how the different families of man come together to overcome that world of war in a society not that much unlike the United States where we have crossed racial boundaries, but it's also true that race still governs where we live, most of who our friends are, our habits, our habits of mind, and our vocabulary. Um, so that we're stuck with racist, we're stuck with violence, uh, and nonviolence is the only word that we have and we still think that it's quain. And what race and violence have in common is that people want to talk about them just long enough to find a safe ground and end the conversation. Um, and that's what happened. And so that race and politics are alternative worlds instead of integral parts of one another. Because when you're talking about democracy in the United States, if you're not talking about race, you're not at the root of democracy, either its problems or its promise. Because that is the lesson that I think comes out of the perils of biographical history when we're trying to address race in America. Thank you.